Uh, we're happy to have uh, Professor Brian Green here today. Uh, he made it through the snow and the uh, slush of the Pacific winter. And uh, yeah, we're excited to uh, actually get things going here. Uh, so uh, a lot of you all are here because you were part of a class that we did um, studying the fabric of the cosmos. So this is the second book that Professor Green wrote. And um, I think we had a lot of fun doing it. I had a lot of fun. Uh, we talked about a lot of uh, physics things, and we tried to relate it a little bit to the liberal arts, uh, which I think we were you know, pretty successful with. Um, and uh, But I know that we were not able to address a lot of things. Uh, so we you know, had you know, a short time each week when we could talk about these things, and there's a lot of concepts in there. Uh, so this is your chance to you know, talk to, uh, get it from the horse's mouth, as they say, right? <laughs> uh, so I'll just start off um, yeah. and just ask, um, how did you, yeah, maybe, maybe tell us a little bit about how you ended up writing this book, um, The Fabric of the Cosmos. I know it's been a while. Uh, yeah, and I have to think back a little bit, but as, as you said, it's the second book that I wrote, and the first, The Elegant Universe, really was, um, it emerged from a sense that, that there were a lot of wondrous ideas that were happening at the cutting edge of physics that were pretty cut off from the general public. Even the interested people in the general public didn't have a way in to some of these ideas. So in the back of my mind, I was thinking about writing a book that was back in 19, I don't know, before you guys were born, 1995 or 6 or something like that. And um, I got a, a knock on my office door. as a professor at Cornell at the time, and it was a publisher from Princeton University Press who said, we're convinced the world needs a book about string theory, and we're told that you're the guy to do it. So, yeah, we spoke a little bit, and it sounded interesting, and, you know, he sends me a contract, but I didn't have any interest in signing a contract because I'd never written a book, and I didn't know if I could do it, and I didn't want to be bound legally to write something if I didn't think it was going well. So I just went off on my own and, and started to write it, The Elegant Universe, and it was going pretty well. So then I went through the usual steps to get the book published, and ultimately did with a different publisher. But as I was writing The Elegant Universe, I had this persistent sense that there was a parallel story that I kept having to push to the side, because otherwise The Elegant Universe would have gotten bloated and too thick with all sorts of ideas, and it wouldn't be a clean description of the search for the unified theory, which is what that book was all about. So while I was writing The Elegant Universe, I felt like there was a second book that was sort of asking to be written where the more strange features of physics, particularly about space and time, would have an airing. And those are the things that you're familiar with, having looked at the book some. Things like entanglement, things like, is space a real substance? All the strange ideas of the quantum effects to do with time, like the quantum eraser, and all those issues that seemingly really challenge the very basic elements of experience, but are at the edge of speculation in terms of what they mean for reality, even among physicists. And that really drove me to write a book where all of those ideas would have a, a place to be discussed. And that's what that second book was all about. That in the advance, uh, you know, it was, it was those two things combined that were really there. Yes. How difficult was it for you to translate such difficult topics into something that everybody could understand? Well, I mean, that's the whole the whole challenge of the of the exercise, and there's a way in which it is difficult. There's a way in which, though, it's a familiar difficulty because as I do my own work, I never feel satisfied if the only understanding I have of what I'm doing is based in the mathematics. And there's some people who are perfectly fine with that. The mathematics and their understanding are effectively one. And 
if they're trying to think something through, the set of equations that are relevant immediately come to mind, and that's the language with which they think through any puzzle in physics. I'm not like that. The mathematics to me is a tool, but ultimately I feel like I want to translate that tool into imagery or words that are not rooted in the technical details, that somehow take a step away from it, which is what I feel I need to have an intuition about any of these ideas. So because I already do that translation of my own work, when it comes to a book, a lot of it is a matter of relying upon ways of thinking about the subject matter that I've already developed, and now just articulating it in a manner that's more accessible to somebody that doesn't have any of the mathematical background. So, so that's sort of the process, but yeah, it is definitely a challenge. And certainly, I mean, I remember for the first book, it was even more of a, 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 you know, an, a new process in terms of writing about the stuff than, than by the time I got to the second book. But in the uh, first book, the chapter on quantum mechanics was the most intimidating of all. I think it's chapter four of The Elegant Universe, and I don't know, there's roughly 15 or so chapters in that book. And I didn't write chapter four until the end. And chapter by chapter by chapter, I kept referring back to chapter four on quantum mechanics that didn't exist. So I kept being like, oh my God, that chapter is going to have to do so much work to make everything that follows make sense. And then when it came time to writing chapter four, it was like, oh my God, here it is. And um, I, didn't, I didn't know how I was going to go about it. But, I, but I, I, I clearly remember at the time I had, a, I had a dog. I used to walk the dog at night in New York, um, and, uh, where I live. And just sort of hit me how I wanted to do it. And it just struck me. I don't know if you've read that chapter in that book or not. but. You know, how do you describe the quantum nature of things to an audience for which that whole conception is going to be pretty foreign? It's even foreign to us. And by a series of metaphors that in some sense latched on the quantized nature of currency, of money, there's sort of a very natural way in that I then kind of developed into little <coughs> stories that make it more interesting to read about. And in the end, it was my favorite chapter of, of the book. But it was definitely the one that, from the perspective of your question, was the, the most intimidating. Where do you think you get that ability to translate um, the very technical concepts into something that layman can read? What part of your training do you think fostered that ability? Well, I don't think, I, I don't think it really comes from any of the traditional training. You know, um, I do remember. <coughs> one experience that I think was formative for me in the sense of deciding that this was the kind of thing that I might want to do in parallel with more standard scientific research. When I was in 11th grade in high school, I don't know if you guys have this, probably not, I hope not, but we had a, a class that for reasons that escaped me was called hygiene. I don't know, were dirty your kids? I, I don't know, it was called hygiene. And it was taught by the, the gym teachers. So that was, uh, they, they had, all of them had a double role in the gymnasium, you know, doing all the stuff that happens there. But they also had to teach a class, and this is a class that they all were required to teach. Now, as you can envision, a class on hygiene, there's not a whole lot of material to cover. You know, they would do things like, you know, tourniquets and CPR and all that sort of stuff. But they couldn't fill a whole semester, so, what they did was they required each kid to teach one of the classes. That's the way they sort of filled in the rest of the time. And so most of the kids were not into doing it and had to do it and would get up there and teach something that the rest of the class wasn't that interested in. But I got real excited about it. So I taught a class on, on sleep and dreams. And kind of took an unusual approach, at least relative to what the other kids were doing. And everyone got excited and they were interested in asking questions and it just felt to me like, wow, here's a way you can take some really interesting scientific research 
on dreams and, and sleep and the subject I was focusing on. And if you tell the story the right way, people can get really excited and into it. And I didn't do much after that, but it was always in the back of my mind that that was something I would want to continue to do. And then when this moment to do the first book arose, that kind of naturally kicked in. And basically ever since, I've been on these two tracks doing uh, this kind of stuff, the books, but other ways of bringing science to the public too, together with the, the more standard research side of things. So a lot of the discussion that came up in our weekly meetings about the book um, was about the metaphors that you were using. Um, and I was just wondering, kind of similar to this question, where did you, where did you get the ideas for all the different metaphors to describe all these theoretical things? Smoking a lot of dope is a, is a, is a very, <laughs> no, none of that, no, it's not at all. And um, you will find, if, you know, if, if you ever try to do this, that if you, if you kind of train yourself or push yourself, in fact, it's not a bad exercise, take any of the metaphors in the book to explain something and throw it away and find your own. And I, I bet you dollars you don't, you'll be able to come up with some, and you may find ones that are better. That, that work better for you or work better for, for everyone. Because there's a tendency when you learn something from an expert to just take it in. You drink it up and now you sort of have it. But it's a very different mindset when you take in an idea and try to own it and bring it back out. And that step of like taking in the idea and bringing it back out is something that I think is a vital part of the learning process, and we typically don't do that, right? I mean, maybe you do in, in here, I don't know, but in the traditional class, you're sitting there and you're soaking it in from somebody knowledgeable. And to me, that's half of the learning process. And we don't focus enough on the other half, which is take it in and then bring it back out, because that's the moment, you talk to any professor, where have you learned the most? Learning or teaching? So doing and teaching, yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and teaching side of it, I mean, every time I teach a class, I, I just taught, and we were just briefly talking, I did a, a class in special relativity. So I've, I learned special relativity a long time ago, you know, whatever it was, 19, um, I don't know, 1980, you know, a long time ago, 35 years or something. I teach this class in special relativity, I learned so much. Because it's one thing to look at the equations and solve the problem. It's another to like, okay, how do I explain that? And how do I get that idea across? And, and that process, if that were part of the educational system more than it is, I think we would all be coming up with these metaphors and ideas all the time. Because that's the only way that you can really get the ideas out there. And it forces you to think about things differently. So I think it's a matter of, of work. It's not some mysterious thing. It's just a matter of really working on your own learning process. And that will naturally happen. Um, I guess, um, Dr. Green, I know that uh, you're a very famous physicist and you're well recognized for your work of popularizing all of these um, very deep and vague uh, theoretical physics. Well, that's good enough for me. Thank you. You can stop right there, and I'll just... Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's how I get started. But yeah. the, the thing is that... Um, I'm afraid there's a but on the other side of this exactly. comment. Exactly. There's always a but. So the thing is that I, I bet there are people who are again, against what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, simply because I think, you know, a lot of people would say physics is such a sacred thing. And uh, other than it's sacred, I mean, it's also very hard for laymen to understand. I mean, this is something that we should keep in the elite class. I mean, this is sort of an idea. But, I mean, I read your website. Um, I don't know if you made the website or somebody else did it. I noticed there are... Depends videos. what you're going to say. That will affect my answer. <laughs> there, there are people who are making videos on there, obviously. Uh, one is from Letterman. The other one is from the Big Bang Theory. And that one I watched uh, from the Big Bang Theory. Sheldon was poking fun at you when you were talking about some kind of quantum stuff. And obviously he was making fun at saying that, uh, why are you just doing this kind of popular, 
popularizing all of these very vague ideas. I mean, how do you, um, in real life, how do you deal with this kind of stuff? And what is your motivation of keep doing what you're doing? Well, I guess, I guess the answer is pretty simple, which is, you know, I feel that everybody out there has a choice. And if they want to engage with me on these ideas, they're free to do so. And if they don't want to engage with me or they want to engage with something or not at all, they're free to do that too. So from that perspective, the real question is, are there enough people that seem that they want? In other words, if I wrote a book and nobody read it, I, you know, I might still have found it a valuable experience, but I would be less motivated to continue to do it. And the fact that there is enough of a, a demand, a hunger, a, a, an excitement about the ideas, that to me is enough that I don't feel like I have to justify or answer to anybody. And again, it's not like I think everybody needs to know about these things. You know, my, uh, a real good example is my mother, who has no idea why anybody would spend their time working, not just describing, but working on this kind of stuff. You know, she's much more, why aren't you a doctor, kind of, you know, that very basic kind of thing. And that's fine, because people come at the deep questions of reality from a variety of perspectives. They don't care about it, it doesn't matter to their life. Their whole well-being and state of mind relies upon it, and you got everything in between. But the other question that was sort of in there was, should this material be viewed as too sacred in some sense, to be kind of blasphemed in a way that it might come across in, in a book that doesn't <coughs> focus on the mathematical underpinnings of everything? And my perspective there is there are popularizations of physics that I do not like. I can't stand them. And the reason I can't stand them is because they're all about hyping the ideas, trying to make them into more than they are, or trying to link them up to the mysteries of life in a more direct way than makes any sense based on our current understanding of how things actually work. That, I, that, I, 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 that repulses me. I hate that stuff. But my own feeling is that if you're true to the core ideas and bring them out with a degree of nuance and subtlety as opposed to the other very flat-footed non, uh, an approach that to me lacks integrity. But if you're going to do it in a way that has integrity, it feels to me that it's, that it's justifiable and worthwhile. But the thing is, everybody draws their line in different places. You know, there, there will be people who look at what I write and it's too far over the line from their perspective and they may hate it as much as I hate the other stuff. But that is a matter of personal choice and personal taste. And for the most part, I've gotten almost no colleagues who have said, wow, how could you say that? In fact, I don't know that that's ever happened, that anyone has said that. Whereas there are a collection of, of writers for whom I'm, I say that all the time, at least internally. So it's, it's basically about finding the place where you're true enough to the ideas and yet accessible enough to get a large number of people engaged with those ideas. What's the, uh, so um, two of the big questions that came up kind of at the beginning and the end of our discussions that we've been having are what the implications are for string theory's kind of correctness or wrongness and um, whether or not it's worth all the research money that's being put into things like they have our collider. And we were, I, I'd just like to know kind of what your thoughts are. Yeah, so as far as string theory goes, the jury is very much out. So the ideas hold together strongly. The progress in theoretical research has been robust. But there's no piece of experimental data that we can point to that either suggests the ideas are a correct description of nature or that suggests the ideas are not a correct description of nature. So we don't know at the moment. I would say there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that things are headed in the right direction. 
the way that the ideas hold together, the way they are able to embrace almost all of the major earlier discoveries. We don't have to sort of throw out the past to bring in the new ideas of string theory. Rather, we can take all the ideas that were carefully developed over the last century and we could have in some sense extracted all of those results from string theory if they hadn't previously been found. So I think all that's very impressive, but that doesn't mean that it's right. And it's possible that a machine like the Large Hadron Collider might give us insight into that. You know, when that machine powers up again, there's a chance that they will see some of the additional particle species that this collection of ideas says should be out there. The problem is if they don't see those species, it doesn't establish that the theory is not correct. It could simply be that the machine isn't strong enough to, to create those particles. But more generally, ask the question, is it worth spending all that we did, $10 billion or whatever, on the Large Hadron Collider? And that's a hard question to answer in isolation. I think you have to look at the way the world spends money and then look at the money being spent here and say, Based on what we do, does that money make sense? I mean, you kind of look over here and you see, well, how much, with the Rocky War, how much was that? Oh, a couple billion dollars a week. A week. And then you're going to worry about the world spending $10 billion to try to understand the deep nature of reality? I don't know. It feels OK to me. <laughs> so my question kind of plays off of that. Um, what do you feel is the state of science policy in the United States? Uh, a lot of these projects require federal funding, so scientists have to go to Congress, lobby for the money, you know, effectively seeing for their supper and laying concerns. So what, what do you think about that? Do you think science policy is going to take a turn for the worse, or do you think it's starting to build back up again like what we had in the 60s? Well, see, the, the, the funny thing is, when you look back at an earlier era, and often people do look at sort of post-1957 or so in the, in the period then, the funding that was coming forward was not out of <coughs> some noble desire to understand the Big Bang or black holes or the structure of matter. It was to beat the Russians, right? Um, and so, so the, in some sense, the question is, will there be a big enough threat that that kind of mentality would kick in again? Or is there a way to actually shift thinking so that these kinds of pursuits are elevated and receive funding for their own right, as opposed to their capacity to make us stronger in the sense of defense or to win out over some major opponent. And that is where, of course, we would love things to go. But there doesn't seem to be any indication that that's the direction that we're headed. So I think the best that we can hope for is a recognition that a vast majority of the challenges that we currently face and the vast majority of the opportunities that we have, when looked at correctly, are scientific at their core. So the things I have in mind are the obvious ones, from alternate energy sources to the possibilities of nanoscale technology to all of the issues about the human genome, personalized medicine, genetically modified food, the one thing that does capture the public's attention real easily, space exploration. So among these and a thousand other pursuits, when hopefully it's understood that decisions about what's worth doing and what's not worth doing, how much should we spend, how much shouldn't we spend, you need to have a scientific understanding of what those pursuits are all about. And the hope is that that will drive a greater degree of attention to the underlying science in making the policy decisions. But whether we'll get there, I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's not obvious that we will.
Well, just speaking about kind of getting the public interest, it seems that there is a bit of a trend on kind of popularizing with these topics like yours, um, Malcolm Gladwell's work is another one in a different area. Do you think that possibly this continuation of higher like ideas within the different scientific fields might become a trend and that authors might come out and try and express these in ways that the public could understand? Well, you know, you go to a bookstore well, they don't really exist any longer. But you go to Amazon, right? And, and you see that there are an enormous number of popularizations. I mean, I'm more familiar with the ones in physics, many of them written by friends of mine. But the number of books written is, is large. So I think there is a general recognition that getting these ideas out there in a way that people can get excited about is generally good for the underlying science. It's good because, as you're saying, ultimately, many of the projects are funded from tax dollars. And if the people paying the taxes are excited about where the tax money is going, that can't help but be a good thing, a good mix to, to take place. So I've certainly been impressed by the degree to which the science community has sort of shifted away from the notion that you were indicating before which may have held sway in the early days when someone like Carl Sagan was a lone voice going out there and many colleagues kind of looked like, what are you doing? What are you doing taking our science and bringing it out that way, sort of as you were indicating before? That is no longer a dominant way of thinking. Another data point along those lines, which really makes that clear, is some years ago in New York, we started an event called the World Science Festival. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's basically, for a while, though it's expanded now, it was five days of intense science programming for general audiences. So this event, there were like 70 events that would happen throughout New York on neuroscience and sustainability and quantum physics and cosmology. And when we started this back in 2006, we started to think about it, we wanted to get a, a board of scientific advisors behind it to show support for this. Naturally, we turned to Nobel laureates, because in the public's mind, and rightly so, these are the, the pinnacle scientists. And there's a general sense from people we spoke to that, look, Nobel laureates have just so many asks on their plate that you're going to get very few who will want to be part of this. But we asked 25 Nobel laureates, and 25 said yes because the mindset had shifted toward the recognition that bringing these ideas out to the public is important. And now, when we have these events each year, you know, we don't have to call up scientists. I mean, I don't actually do the programming, but the team that does, they don't have to call up scientists to convince them to come. For the most part, scientists are, are knocking on the door of the World Science Festival with ideas for programming that they want to be part of during the event. They want to be out there doing this, as opposed to having to be convinced to be part of an event of this sort. So I think all of that suggests, in answer to your question, that there really is a recognition of how important it is to get the ideas out there to the public. Uh, this is perhaps a slightly more technical question, but since you brought up the large hadron slide earlier, I was wondering if you could just give a brief rundown of where we are in terms of experimental confirmation of string theory with respect to what's happened since the discovery of the Higgs boson. Um, have there been any discoveries of supersymmetric particles or anything that looks like it might be, especially with the upgrade that's going on right now? So uh, in terms of experimental string theory, what is that? Yeah, no, it's a good question. It's sort of the experiments behind supporting these ideas. Other things you all want to talk about. <laughs> it's, a, it's a kind of quick answer, which is there's nothing. Okay. Uh, no, so, uh, and, and what is the, so what does that mean? So either it means that the ideas are wrong, and that would be, in, that in and in of itself would be very interesting. Supersymmetry, one of the ideas that you mentioned, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it's a, a very natural extension of our theoretical ideas, which to be true requires a whole collection of particles that we've never seen. So the hope is that they would be seen at the Large Hadron Collider, and the hope is that we have seen them by now. We haven't. That has narrowed the window of opportunity where the particles might be. It's not ruled it out. 
And it could be that when the machine turns back on, they will be found. In fact, there's a way in which you can view it quite optimistically. We've narrowed the window. So if these ideas are correct, there's not much more that we're going to have to probe to find them because the window is, is closing in. But if we don't find them, it either means that supersymmetry is wrong or that, again, it manifests itself at an energy scale too high for that machine to reveal the particles. So it could be a curious state of affairs. It could be that the machine finds nothing. And then what do we do at that point? Because it doesn't say that the ideas are necessarily wrong, but yet it's an interesting challenge to go back to the funding sources, back to your question, and say we need 10 billion or 20 billion more dollars. Why? Ah, we need it because something really interesting happened at the Large Hadron Collider. And what was that? We didn't find anything. That's a strange argument to make, but scientifically justifiable one. In fact, I wrote an article in the New York Times some years ago anticipating that this might happen because finding nothing is scientifically interesting. It suggests that ideas that we've been developed either need radical reshaping or need to be interpreted in a different way. So finding nothing is a result, but it's not a result that somehow gets people as excited as finding the actual positive. The negative is, is still a result. So we'll see what will happen. The word on the street is that, that the Chinese, the China, Chinese government is, is interested in building the next collider. And there's already work underway, at least at the planning stages, for that. And were that to happen, that could be the next machine. And it would be, it would be great. It would put China on the map in, in a way that it hasn't been so far. It would be the central place on Earth for particle physics to take place. And people say that if it was to go forward, it could be in the order of you know, 10 to 20 years. That seems optimistic to me. <coughs> but it could be that we'd have a new machine. Now, 10 to 20 years is short on you know, the time scales of the universe, but it's long on the time scale of a career. So there will be people who have retired by them, and, and that just may be what happens. So we may not know the answers. And even with the next machine, we may not know the answers. But that's the nature of research. You don't know. You're willing to take a chance. And there's some people who don't want to take that big a chance. They want to work on something that, on the time scales of months or maybe a year, will yield a result or not, and they can move on. And there are many areas of science and physics where you can do that. There's some who see the big prize, and these are big prizes. You find supersymmetric particles, that is a radical, radical discovery. It tells us that there's quantum dimensions to space. It tells us that there's deep symmetry principles at work even beyond the ones that we've so far confirmed. But with big prizes comes big risks. And the big risk is you don't find anything, so you don't know. So what we have you here, it'd be nice to kind of get a really deep, uh, I guess, explanation for what pea brains are, <laughs> not like PEA. Yeah. Um, and what, uh, yeah, what some of the extra dimensionality yep. means in terms of the universe. Yeah, so the, the big discovery, which happened again now some years ago in 1995, which was already 10 years after the earlier discovery that set string theory in motion in a, in a big way. The big discovery in 1995 is that string theory is not a theory that only contains strings. Strings are the ingredients in string theory that we found first, mathematically, of course. But more careful mathematical analyses revealed that they were not just these one-dimensional filaments, but they're also two-dimensional membranes or even three-dimensional blob-like configurations, even four-dimensional ones and five-dimensional. They get harder to picture, but mathematically, they're there. So this notion of membranes emerged because of this analysis. And because <clears throat> these membranes come in a variety of dimensions, the idea of a membrane, which is two dimensions, was renamed as a two-brain, two-dimensional membrane, two-brain for short, or a three-brain, three-dimensional membrane, three-brain for short, 
or in the general case, we typically don't use the P, but a, a, a D. D brain is the collection of these guys, but you can certainly have a P-dimensional D brain or a P brain for short, if you like the language. But that is the basic idea that remarkably to many of us in the field who worked on the subject for a decade before 1995, that hidden within the equations, there were more ingredients than we had recognized for a long time. And most striking of all, these ingredients don't have to be tiny. So there can be a large three-dimensional membrane, a large three-brain, and what would that look like? Well, it turns out it would kind of look like our universe. So our universe could be a three-dimensional blob in a higher dimensional realm. And therefore, reality as we know it is just one sliver of this larger spatial expanse within which we would be floating. And this is an idea that people have been pursuing. Brain universe models, they're called. Uh, so kind of going off of that discussion, um, my professor from philosophy of science had a question he wanted to ask to be here. Um, and it had to do with knowledge and confirmation. Uh, if a professor of philosophy asks a question, but he's not actually the mayor to ask it. What he was wondering is, uh, I'm hoping you can speak about this from the cutting edge um, information you would have, yeah. um, was if there's any potential that in the future we might have what we think of as knowledge that can't be empirically confirmed, since typically yeah. we expect knowledge to require justified true belief, which is something like empirical evidence, et cetera. And we're wondering if there's anything like that. I don't think so in any time scale that matters to us or even to the species. I can't imagine that we'll ever get to a point when we're really willing to accept ideas without empirical verification. If you ask me in a more theoretical sense, though, I can certainly envision a time, way, way off, when merely by virtue of demanding logical consistency, we might be able to follow a chain of reasoning that yields the laws of physics. And then you wouldn't need to verify, because if that structure was uniquely determined by the one requirement of logical consistency, and I think most of us would be willing to buy that to be able to perform any kind of rational explanation, to give any kind of rational explanation of the universe, you've got to assume logic. You've got to assume that it's not inconsistent internally. So if the requirement of logical consistency uniquely yielded a body of physical law, then I think that would be it. We'd be kind of done at that stage. Because no matter what why question you ask, there'll be an answer. And if you ask why that, there'll be an answer. And then finally, if you ask enough why questions, to get right down to the root. And the answer will be because logical consistency alone demands it. And then there's no further why question to ask, because I think that's such a basic axiom that we'd be willing at that stage to say, we're done. But the likelihood of that happening in any time scale that we can envision, I think, is pretty small. But at least I can imagine it. So along those lines, uh, we, the professor was talking about sort of guest lecture that we briefly overview this guy with Richard Haywood's work we talked about, like the fees of like how string theory, like you mentioned, is so far beyond the empirical proving by now, but like whether or not um, we can think of it as knowledge. Are you familiar with his work at all? Is Who is it again? Richard Haywood. Um, this is a relatively recent book, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've, not, I've not read it, yeah. but I do know of it. Well, I don't know enough. It, it came highly recommended, but I've not I've not read it. Well, I guess I, I can't ask the question I want to ask. I don't know much about it. But uh, what I was going to what I do want to ask is, you talk about how like um, the, the LHC might not find these supersymmetric particles because they're you know we're not exactly sure how massive they are. Yes. And I, I believe the book the word used in your book is because the math is still so approximate in regard to string theory. Um, and I'm just curious is like what is like obviously it's a very complex subject and that's sort of what's keeping us from getting it like nailed down, but 
is there a sense that that's the only thing, or do we need in some ways some sort of empirical data to continue to get the math down to concrete enough levels where we can concretize these? Oh, this particle is definitely going to be this big, not like a range. What's keeping us from getting to that level of understanding in math? I think it's certainly a combination of both. If you look back at the history of, say, a subject like quantum mechanics, there was this almost day-to-day, -day, it's probably a little bit of an exaggeration, but a kind of day-to-day -day interaction between the experimental ideas and the theoretical ideas. In fact, day-to-day -day might not even be that much of an exaggeration because I believe it was the case that when Max Planck wrote down in 1900 his ideas about radiation and cavities that would come from the rudimentary notions of quantization that he was employing at the time, the exchange between radiation in the walls of the cavity and the interior. I believe it was within a day one of the experimenters had done a detailed analysis of the implications of those ideas and compared it to the actual data. Gave him feedback. Yeah. So, so, so it was a very hand in glove kind of relationship between theory and experiment. And obviously, that is a powerful exchange to take place. And if we had daily input from experiment on what was happening at very high energy scales, very short distance scales, it would have a profound impact on what we do. But the fact of the matter is, we've built the machines that we can build, and those machines can give us insight up to, you know, uh, a few thousand times the mass of a proton. But the ideas that we work on are taking place at scales that dwarf that. So we don't really have any direct input. Well, cosmology sometimes gives us some input, but we don't have the kind of input that we were having in the early days of quantum mechanics. So yes, that is a big stumbling block, and it means that theorists are, in some sense, more free to come up with ideas, and they aren't as constrained by having to talk and explain data immediately. But that's only part of it. The other part of it is we've entered a, a domain where the mathematical ideas are extraordinarily challenging. So string theory is a kind of simple theory to write down at some level, but you know, string theory and even quantum field theory to some extent, these are complicated structures. And for the most part, we analyze them by doing approximations, perturbation theory, as it's called. And that can only take you so far. Now, we have, through the insights of a number of people, been able to go much further than any of us would have thought back in 1990. Back in 1990, there was a thought, we'll only ever be able to do these sort of first order, second order, third order calculations. And then along came a variety of great insights which gave a whole new set of techniques that are far more accurate than any of those approaches. But still, what's left to conquer is, is huge. So who knows what it will take, but certainly Tremendous mathematical insight and whatever ideas and illumination we can get from experiment is, is important. But you do what you can. You don't just stop because, I mean, some people say, oh, these ideas are too hard based on what we know. and based on, We're just so far beyond data that there's no point. You're no longer doing science. That, that's just silly. That's just plain silliness. It means that you're doing more speculative science because the data is not there to confront it day by day. So in the book, you talk about the Higgs as kind of like this theoretical thing. It hadn't yet, we haven't yet found evidence about it. When CERN actually came out and said, we have five sigma certainty that we found in Higgs, what was your, what was your first reaction when you heard that? Well, it was so expected that it was going to happen. You know, I, I, I don't think I wrote in here, but I wrote in some article that when I first learned about the Higgs idea back in graduate school, it was spoken of by the instructor with such certainty that I didn't know it was hypothetical. I thought it was a fact of how the world works. And it was later on that I was like, oh, oh, so that's just an idea. We don't know if that's right. 
So that was the attitude among everybody, that of course this idea is right, it's just a matter of establishing it. So on the one hand, there was a sense of, great, we sort of established the stuff that we knew. It almost felt like we already knew it. And, um, and that, that is, of course, tremendously exciting for mathematical ideas to be confirmed. I mean, that's what we're doing right now. So we want that kind of pattern to persist. At the same time, there certainly was a sense of, wouldn't it have been more exciting if they hadn't found it? Because if they hadn't found it, we'd be back in the situation that we sort of discussed before of having to develop new ideas. In other words, in, in this case, if you didn't find the Higgs, it would really require that you rip out the heart of what we thought to be the case and uh, develop a new approach, which would be very exciting for a theorist. Now we're freed of that idea that we thought was true and let's come up with something new. So it was kind of both sides, excitement but also a sense of, huh, I guess that's over, that part of it. Now we move on. Um, a lot of, so I guess as you progress in string theory and like the knowledge of it, how do you reconcile, uh, reconcile the fact that a lot of ideals are like not intuitive? And like kind of like, if an ideal is too radical, then like, it, uh, there's an opinion that like an ideal is too radical and it's not too wrong? Well, I, I think the best way to think about that is historically. You know, in the time of Newton, his ideas were kind of radical because people weren't trying to use equations to describe the world. But at least the underlying ideas were completely intuitive. You know, you throw a ball with a greater force, it'll land further away. That all makes sense. We all experience that. But then by the time you get to Maxwell, and even further, by the time you get to quantum mechanics, the ideas that people are developing are pretty counterintuitive, pretty not aligned with <coughs> everyday experience. So quantum mechanics has a whole host of crazy ideas, particles and waves and tunneling and probabilistic description of how the world behaves and the possibility that reality is one way when it's not being observed and another way when it is being observed. So a whole host of completely non-intuitive ideas that by any rational account should be wrong. They should be wrong, but they're right. The data shows that they're right. So I think that convinces us that we, sh we can't trust that our intuition will point us in the right direction when it comes to the laws of physics. Because if we follow that directive, we would have missed quantum mechanics. And if we missed quantum mechanics, we would have missed more or less everything. So I think that is good evidence that when an idea is weird or crazy or strange, that's not cause to dismiss it, so long as the idea is well motivated, mathematically articulated, and has the capacity to, at least in principle, hook up with actual observation. Now the only other thing I say about that is there's a, a danger in that, where I've seen this happen so many times, people say, well, they say, I've got this crazy idea. And the crazy ideas of quantum mechanics are true, and therefore, since my idea is also crazy, my idea must be true. It's kind of a, a, a curious kind of reasoning. And you see this sort of all the time out there. I could give you stories of places where I've been where people have made important life decisions based on that kind of reasoning. And obviously, that's not true. Not all crazy ideas are right. But some crazy ideas should not be dismissed by virtue of their craziness because they may be right. So I think, I, I guess I might be misremembering this, but like Einstein disagreed with like an implication of general relativity, so he made the cosmological constant. And so like we also disagree with quantum mechanics. So like, do you think like his approach to like fixing the theory to like make it more intuitive is like I deal with this? Well, but that's a very good example where the fix was wrong. So. He didn't agree with the notion of an expanding universe from quantum mechanics, uh, from general relativity. So to deal with that, he changes the equations in a way that's completely sensible. It's not like he did something crazy. Oftentimes people say, Einstein mangled the beautiful math of general relativity to bring it in line with his thinking about the world. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
the term that he added is the most sensible, logical, reasonable thing in the world. In fact, we believe that that term is there. It just has a different value than what Einstein thought. So Einstein was trying to force the math to agree with his intuition, and nature slapped him. You know, so I think we should take that to heart. <coughs> Kind of going off what you were talking about earlier, and I remember probably you talked about do you see any way in which this like probability, probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics and like, how it kind of skirts um, causality in a sense would bring it into that logical determination of events that you talked about being uh, known by us somewhere way, way in the future? You know, where if you ask, it seems to me, you know, if you end up asking, you know, why did the, the photons come up over here rather than over there? And quantum seems to say there is no cause. You know, I'm sure that there could be one that we just haven't found yet, but do you have any, any thoughts on that really? Just how it seems to, basically what I'm asking is it seems to skirt like the necessary causation that everything else in physics, you know, dictates it should, and that's why it seems so counterintuitive. Yeah, I think a lot of people think of quantum mechanics that way, but I would encourage you n not to. It's not so much that quantum mechanics changes anything about causality or causation. It simply emphasizes to us that those elements of reality that we thought, previously thought, defined reality, those were the wrong elements to focus upon. So in the old days, we used to focus upon the position and the speed of particles, basically. So if you know where every particle is and how every particle is moving, then you've described reality. And quantum mechanics tells us that that was an incorrect Newtonian notion. The way you describe reality according to quantum mechanics is you give the probability distribution of all the particles. And then you're done. And in that language, the probability distribution of all the particles, that distribution is governed by ironclad deterministic laws. The Schrodinger equation, if you like, these ideas, it's this beautiful differential equation, and it plays the role for the probability distribution as F equals MA did for particle positions and velocities. So the structures are exactly parallel in the sense of you start with things like this, and the equations determine with 100% certainty the distribution later. 100% certainty. Now the weird thing is it's determining with 100% certainty a probability distribution which we feel oh there's uncertainty in there because it could be here or there. But again that's a Newtonian view that reality is when the particle is here or there. According to quantum mechanics this is reality. And it is governed by as rigid a mathematical structure as the positions and velocities of particles are governed by F equals MA, Newtonian mechanics. No change from that perspective. Kind of piggybacking off that a little bit. So one of the, I mean, it's not a metaphor. One of the things you talk about in your book, uh, in this book that we read, is how space-time is this concrete entity, uh, in particular the time axis, that doesn't, you talk about the difference between the flow of time that we perceive and the reality of space-time. Yeah. And, you know, how the arrow of time ultimately is due to this low entropy configuration early in the universe. Um, but with quantum mechanics, we have this issue where the observer comes in and affects, collapses the wave function. You talk a little bit about this idea called decoherence. To sort of, um, you know, with a Schrodinger equation, right, can't totally be it, so how do we connect the micro and the macro? Um, I sort of understood that. I mean, I, I have some vague yeah. idea of decoherence, but I wonder if you could talk about, a little, talk about that a little bit, and I know it's been 10 years since the book was written, and I don't know if there's any um, developments. Well, all of that has to do with an area that is still unresolved which is the so-called quantum measurement problem. And the quantum measurement problem exists in the swirl of ideas that you were just describing. So in quantum mechanics, we have this equation that determines the probability distribution. But then somehow, when we measure a particle, 
we always find it at one location or another, which seems to suggest that the probability distribution is affected by the observation, forcing it to spike, or people call it collapse, that the whole wave collapses and only in one location does it spike, and it spikes at the location where you found the particle. That description, often called the Copenhagen approach, which was inspired by ideas of Niels Bohr and the whole Copenhagen school, I would say very, very few physicists believe that that's actually how things work. There are, there are some, and um, some of them are quite prominent. So at least as of a few years ago, a guy named Anton Zeilinger, who was likely, you know, worthy of and will likely win the Nobel Prize sometime soon for all his work in quantum mechanics. You know, as he and I discussed these ideas, he would just sort of chuckle in a kind of avuncular way that I was at all disturbed or thought there was a problem. And he was like, no, 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 the Copenhagen, that's it. There's nothing else that needs to be said. But I think most people don't have that view. Most people have the view that the act of observation is nothing special. It's just one collection of particles being brought into contact with another collection of particles that the laboratory equipment are made of. And the laboratory equipment is just another collection of particles that's being brought to bear on that single electron that's being measured. And since everything is just groups of particles talking to each other, it should be the very same Schrodinger equation at work. And there's no place in that equation where probability waves can have this collapsing or spiking evolution. That kind of evolution doesn't happen in the equation. So most of us say, well, that's, that's troubling. So does a new process come in at the act of observation? Again, most people don't think so, but some suggest it. Or is there something else mysterious going on? So we don't know the answer, but at least one hint of an answer comes from this idea of decoherence. So coming out to your question, which is that you can establish mathematically that when a lot of particles, like in a piece of equipment or the environment, comes into contact with, say, a single particle, like an electron. And if the electron has a probability to be at various locations, an interesting thing happens in that interaction, which is the capacity for quantum interference which is the hallmark of quantum mechanics. I mean, the fact that probability waves are spread out, the way they talk to each other, is wave interference. But what happens with decoherence is when you have lots of particles involved, the possibility of wave interference, you can show mathematically, gets driven very quickly to nearly zero. So it's virtually impossible for a macroscopic piece of equipment to go into a superposition, to be in some sort of interference, um, combination that it inherits from the electron that might be, have some non-zero probability to be at different locations. So there's a sense in which having a lot of stuff suppresses some of the quantum quality that is quite manifest for a single particle. Now that doesn't answer the quantum measurement problem. It just suggests why it is that in the everyday world, we don't experience all the weirdness of quantum mechanics in a more direct way through, say, quantum interference. But it still doesn't answer the question of if the electron has a 50% chance to be here and 50% chance to be there, and you measure it, and you find it over here, it doesn't tell us what happened to that other possibility. It doesn't tell us how it is that the electron sort of snapped to attention <coughs> and now is at a definite location where a moment ago it seemed not to have that quality. That still is unresolved. I guess, and I guess I connected those two. Maybe I didn't explain my question just because, I mean, you, you sort of described that as a problem for, a potential problem for this arrow of time, right? Because if there is this observer that comes in, yeah. you know, then that sort of, everything after that wave function collapsed and it's different, I guess. Yeah, so I don't know if there's a connection between those two issues, the arrow of time and the quantum measurement problem. But they do inhabit sort of the same collection of puzzles, right? So the arrow of time, we think, has something deeply to do with conditions near the Big Bang, as you're, you're recounting from, from the book. Low entropy conditions near the Big Bang seem to be what set the initial order 
and we've been living through the degradation of that order ever since, and that degradation is the direction that we associate to future as opposed to past. But that story requires truly having a quantum understanding of cosmology. And that means you need to really put quantum mechanics and gravity together and have it work in the extreme environments of the early universe. And that's something that we don't really know how to do. So that's why we don't have a full answer to an issue like that. Sure. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about any of the terminology in physics that might lead the general public to have misconceptions about what it means um, and how you address them. Well, any of them you wish you could rename? Sort of the big one, of course, is the, is the word theory, which isn't <laughs> sort of physics oriented per se. But as you know, in science, theory is a very precise term, meaning you know, the most efficient, leanest, powerful set of ideas able to explain a range of physical phenomenon. And that means that it's not just Sherlock Holmes having a theory about what might have happened in some or other circumstance. It really is our best answer in order to the question of how do things work. And you know, I can't tell you the number of times people conflate the English use of that word with the scientific use of that word in order to, in some way, shape, or form, denigrate the scientific perspective as to just being a theory, where the just, what does that mean, just, but that's, uh, theory is the bread and butter of our currency, that, that's how we work, those are our ideas. So I say that's really the big one. But the other side, of course, quantum mechanics of language has been taken over by the public in so many ways. I mean, if you go home and you just Google quantum mechanics and almost any other word, you'll find them linked. So I, I have these pictures, I don't have any with me now, where you know, quantum mechanics is used from everything from you know, quantum mechanical pizza <laughs> topping <laughs> devices that I've seen to quantum baseballs, to quantum golf clubs, to there's this quantum sleeper you can look up where it's supposed to protect you from bioterrorist attacks. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just sort of, so quantum mechanics has sort of become the catch-all phrase of weird features of science that somehow are transformative in their power. And I guess that's not such a bad thing, but you know, quantum mechanics is very, as you know, specific. And it's so potent in its own right that it just almost feels tragic if that side of the story winds up getting no airtime. Instead, you know, you get your quantum golf clubs. So. So you mentioned this briefly, but could you elaborate more on the illusion of time? Because I feel like you pushed the card and like my understanding of it was. And so, like, um, kind of like we do experience time, like, there is ca this, this, like, an appearance of causation. And, like, uh, Professor Rookie mentioned the electric class of time, but, like, according to special relativity, like, the, even though you can view events, like, in different perfect, uh, reference frame, the, like, if events that happen can't be changed, if you change the reference frame? Yeah, so, so I guess a couple things. So, first, there are some people who think time actually is illusory, and I'm not among those people. Time is a real thing. Whether it's fundamental in the makeup of reality, I don't know, but certainly at the level of experience that we have access to, I think time is a, is a real thing. But I do think that many of the experiences of time that are familiar are illusory. And among them, I think the flow of time is likely illusory. You know, the sense that we're going moment to moment to moment is, I think, an artifact of our brains making sense of perception and organizing our thoughts in a sequence that, for whatever evolutionary reasons, allows us to survive. And I think, ultimately, it's, it is Darwinian evolution that has forced us to think about the world in the terms that we do, especially when it comes to time. But as far as relativity, special relativity in particular, what does it tell us? Well, it tells us that the fundamental 
aspects of time that deserve attention are the causal relationships, so getting to what you're asking. So if A can cause B, that's something that everybody will agree on, regardless of their state of motion. If A can't cause B, because they're too far apart, and the amount of time between the two events is too short for any signal to get from one to the other, that's again something that everybody will agree on, regardless of their perspective or their frame of reference. But the other things that we ordinarily think of as definite and real, such as how long did it take for that event to happen? Or what's the distance between that location in space-time and that other location? Those are not invariant. Those are not real in the sense that not everyone will agree upon them. Change your frame of motion and you will have a different description of how long something takes place or how much distance there is from one location to another. So that is the illusory side of things. And Einstein took this further and pushed it to basically saying that the whole demarcation, the whole division into past, present, and future, which I think everybody holds in their mind, right? Who doesn't think of reality as the things that have happened, the things that are happening, and the things that will happen? I think everybody thinks of reality that way. And Einstein was saying it's kind of a mistake to think of it that way because different observers undergoing different motion will have different conceptions of that. So there is no universal invariant notion of what is past and what is future and what is present. So in that sense, hanging your hat on them and developing an understanding of reality with that idea as being central is a mistake. Because all it is is a subjective <coughs> division that has no universal meaning. So I guess this is a clear, uh, for more clarification. Um, as a universe, you because of the uh, intricate at the beginning of the universe. Sorry, say it again. So like the uh, look at the universe at the beginning, like while you experience, while we think you experience the flow of time. Um, I feel like causation, like from so even though you say the moments, moments aren't actually there. I feel like due to causation, like it does have some structure. Well, I'm saying the moments are there. But I would consider them to be just these independent moments that constitute reality. And they're all just out there. Every, every moment is out there. And then all that we do as observers in this reality is each and every one of us organizes those events in a way that makes sense to us. So we say, oh, all of those events, those happened at the same moment from my perspective, so I'm going to call those at one moment in time. And all of those events, they happened at one moment. I'm going to put those on one moment of time. So we all do this work. We, we, we walk into this raw data of all the events and we start to organize them. But different individuals who walk into that room of events will organize them differently. And it's not like one is right and one is wrong. It's just a different organizational scheme that is dictated by the laws of special relativity or general relativity. So the events and the moments are real, but the way in which we group them is totally subjective, even though Newton would have called that objective. Can you give an example of that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, here we are, right? So I go like this. Now, from my perspective, I hit the table simultaneously with my right hand and my left hand, and from your perspective, it should be the same thing. We should all, because we're all in the same frame of reference right now. But, you know, if you get up and start to walk, and you carefully do your measurement, you would not agree that they happen at the same moment in time. You would say what happened was, and it's not a question of sort of the light traveled, how the sound traveled. I'm not talking sort of that level of silliness, right? We all know, you go to the baseball game, you look at the guy at home plate, hits the ball, and like you see it, and then you hear it. You don't think all oh, those happened at two different moments. Like you, you process it. You're like, oh, like the sound took longer to reach me than the light. You undo all that. And you're like, yes, of course, those moments happen together. You know, the sound and the light emit at the same moment. I'm talking about something far deeper. Your understanding of what happened will be different. You'll put them on different moments of time because your clocks and our clocks will fall out of sync when you engage in motion relative to us. So this is like a little you know, simple example. Of course, the world, we organize the world based upon what things happen at a given moment. 
and your organization and my organization will agree, if we're not moving relative to each other, that someone who's moving will have a different notion of what happens at the same time. So in your Nova Special and throughout the you know, books, you talk about like, like the smallest idea that we have is an atom. And then you break it down into the different particles, and you're like, well, in the particles there are quarks, and in quarks there are streams. Um, and so it just kind of seems like this flow of getting smaller and smaller. Yeah. So the strings vibrate in different dimensions. Yeah. I feel like the strings have to be in something. I know they're in quarks, but like I've heard quantum foam is an idea, or like how small can you get, and what are those? Well, well, nobody knows, and and again, we don't even know if the stringy part yeah. of that story is true. Yeah. The only one that we really have confidence in, you know, are the electrons and the quarks and a variety of other particles that are very similar to those that we don't talk about quite as much, like the muon and the tau, and all, but they're all basically electrons and quarks, mm -hmm. fancier names, and we don't know what goes further. But the theory suggests that there may be these strings inside of those particles. And then there are people who have suggested that maybe strings have finer constituents too. So people have studied that possibility and, it, and it's something that people do look at. And where would it stop? Now one possibility is that it simply stops with strings. And that's the last time that you can ask what is it made out of? That there isn't a finer ingredient to talk about. But A, that assumes that string theory is right and B, it assumes that string theory uh, you know, is the deepest fundamental explanation. Neither of those are points that we know to be true. When you talk about quantum foam, that's actually looking at the nature of space itself, space-time even, and asking is, is space-time in some sense made of something as opposed to being a fundamental idea that you just assume is there and everything inhabits it and you don't worry about its fundamental makeup. But you may need to worry about its fundamental makeup. It could be that space-time itself is made of finer constituents, maybe strings, I don't know. Or maybe some other idea that we haven't yet gotten to. Or there's a whole collection of people who work on something called loop quantum gravity. And they think of space-time as a kind of, they call it a spin foam. So, so there, you're at the edge of understanding here. We don't even know if it's the right question to ask. But if it is the right question to ask, then the interesting thing is, what's the answer? What are the ingredients of space-time? And, uh, and we don't know. And just kind of going on that, you mentioned briefly in the last chapter of your book this one understanding of this string theory talking about zero brains and how strings are possibly made of those. And I'm just wondering, how can something having zero dimensions make up something that anything substantial? Does it have energy that it contributes to the string? Or like well, how yes. Does that work? Yeah, so, you know, even in the, in the conventional description of particles that comes to us from quantum mechanics, a subject called quantum field theory, in that description, you do envision particles being located at individual points not sort of a collection of points, which would be like a little yeah. sphere, mm -hmm. really at a, a little location. So already there you sort of run into a little bit of this conundrum. And what does it mean for a particle to, to be at a point? And usually, at least the way we think about it intuitively, is that even if the particle is a point, it's kind of surrounded by a fog associated, say, with this electric charge, this electric field around it. And that electric field has photons associated with it and sort of this crowd of particles surrounding the basic particle itself. But it's, it's, it's hard to grasp and generally we envision that when you fully include quantum theory into these stories, there's a certain kind of fuzziness along those lines. It's always there and that's where you can have an image that's somewhat closer to something that seems sensible. But yes, in, in the mathematical description, we do sometimes envision things as having no size, or no thickness, or no length. So I guess what I'm trying to ask is, how can something with those properties make up something of one dimension, the string? Well, you know, take this table, for example, right? So this table looks like it's a three-dimensional chunk, right? But 
even without the exotic ideas of, say, string theory, if you look into this table, you know that you get to molecules, you get to atoms, and then you've got the atoms which themselves are little tiny electrons going around the nucleus with little tiny particles. Now, now we often say the, the atom has size. Why does it have size? Because you've got an electron in some cloud-like orbit around the nucleus, and there's empty space between them, although there's fields that are being exchanged, particles are being exchanged between the nucleus and the electron itself. So even though the, the particles might be little dots in the conventional description, there's still a thing called the atom by virtue of the way the particles are talking to each other and combining with each other and hanging around near each other. So there you've got it. So you've got this thing, whatever it is, 10 to the minus 10 meters typically for the size of an atom. Even though in the conventional quantum description, the ingredients are little tiny dot particles. So in some sense, I think a good way to think about it is in terms of the, the electric fields or the other fields, nuclear fields, but think electric for now. The electric fields that these objects produce, emanate, are what give them more of a tangible structure compared to the dot-like description in the mathematics. Does that help the question? I mean, not really, but that's more my fault. I'm just like trying to picture like, so if you take like, take like a bunch of lines drawn on paper, right? If we're, if, you, if we're talking about like the line has, let's say two dimensions, even to make it easier. Yeah. Right? The paper's on the table. I draw it, it has this, whatever length, we'll call it. And then it has height too, because the pencil draws that line. But it doesn't have depth, yeah, up and down. And like, so you can stack it. Like, to me, it seems infinity of those lines. You can on top of each other, and you never get any of a third dimension of depth. That's so right. So if you have these particle zero brains containing zero dimensions, how do you combine them? Yeah, so it's usually a question of, of, of the mathematical conception of stacking compared to the physical reality of how these ingredients talk to each other. So a concrete example is, you, you may be familiar with, say, the, the Pauli exclusion principles. Is that a familiar yeah. idea in quantum mechanics? So that's a nice idea in this context because that tells us that at least for certain classes of particles, you can't actually mush them all together on top of each other because that would be putting them all in exactly the same state. And the equations don't allow that to happen. And because of that, when you try to mush them all on top of each other, they actually spread out because of that mathematical restriction. So there you sort of see it the laws of physics at work, how that process differs from the mathematical one of either drawing a lot of dots in one spot or a lot of lines on top of each other. So that's the way in which sort of quantum mechanics helps to spread out the world in a way that's closer to what we envision and experience. I had one question. Um, just about the nature of strings themselves. I've taken acoustics and whenever you model like a standing wave on a string, you can break that string up into little tiny masses. Is there any way that we could feasibly do, do that with strings? Like could we go deeper than the string itself? In principle, yes. So, so it's sort of related to, the, like, as you are saying, it's related to the other question. You know, people have envisioned that strings could sort of be a kind of necklace-like structure of more fine entities whose analog in the classical mechanics of strings that you're talking about would be the little mass elements uh, uh, along a length dx along the string. So yes, is that possible? It is. Is that right? I don't know. Again, I don't know if string theory is, is right. But it is something that people study, for sure. I have a question. Um, you mentioned that there's a so in this room, we have a number of um, senior physics majors who are heading off into their careers along many different paths. And I'm just curious, what advice would you give to someone at this beginning phase of their career in science? Well, it, it sort of depends on what, what kind of beginning phase we're talking about. So, you know, it's funny, just before I came here, I got an email, which is not an unfamiliar one, where some kids somewhere wrote, you know, I read your book and, uh, and um, love these ideas. I'm, the, I'm not doing that well in school in my classes, but 
you know, I, I, I really just love these ideas and this is what I want to do. And, you know, and my answer to all those is, you know, great that you love it, really excited you love that it is, get to work, do well in your, in, because you've got to learn all the basic stuff if you're ever going to go forward. And, 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 and you know, that, that story is, you know, recapitulated so many times. I'll have people come to my classes. You know, in the first day, I'll sort of have like hundreds of students in the class. And by like the third day, I'm down to a sensible number. Why? They kind of all thought that it was just going to be the ideas. And that's okay if you're, in, if you're not trying to actually go forward in the actual physics research. But if you are going forward in the physics research, you have to really engage at a much deeper level than in, say, Fabric of the Cosmos or the Elegant Universe. Um, so, so my first piece of advice to anybody who actually wants to do this stuff is get excited by the ideas, but recognize that it's hard work, and you really have to do that work if you, if you want to be involved in that way. But there's also the, the flip side is it's tremendous just to spend time in your life, regardless of what you're doing, struggling with the ideas, and then forget about the math, just try to get the ideas as deep as you can. And that's something I, I try to communicate not just through books. So, you know, you know, NOVA programs that I've done, try to get things in, out that way. Right now, frankly, I've been spending more of my time developing theatrical works. Yeah, that's a bit of a strong word, theatrical works, but works that are somewhere in between lecture and theater that allows an audience, again, who doesn't have technical background, to not just hear these ideas put forward in a way that I will do later today, which is just me talking about these ideas, and hopefully it'll be somewhat interesting, maybe even entertaining, I don't know, but it is still just the ideas. Whereas there are other formats that can communicate the drama of scientific discovery in a more effective way. And, and, and I think that's another side of the story. So I think there are many ways these ideas can play a part in how one lives their lives. But getting back to the <coughs> question, if you actually want to be involved in pushing the frontiers, you have to engage with the man. And there's no substitute. Don't try to jump ahead to string theory before quantum mechanics and quantum field theory and general relativity and complex analysis and differential equations and all that good stuff because you need it all to be able to make progress. Um, could you explain a little bit more about this theatrical stuff you're starting to work on? Because um, I'm a physics major, but I'm also a theater major. Oh, is that right? That, that really I didn't know there was such a thing. Yeah. Well, so uh, a couple of years ago, I, I was involved in a piece that uh, was called Spooky Action, a drama of quantum mechanics. And it was a 90-minute program in which I, in some sense, played the role of narrator in the piece. And the goal was to take an audience that knew nothing about quantum mechanics and take them through basically what you've read in Fabric of the Cosmos, all that stuff, entanglement, and um, even Bell's theorem, which is, you may recall is in, if you, if you had the courage to read those sections of the book. And, uh, but I wouldn't do it alone on stage. I did it with three actors who spoke words that were completely taken from the historical record. And those were the words of Einstein and Bohr and Heisenberg and Schrodinger and Pauli and Freeman Dyson and all these folks. And they didn't try to embody those words in any realistic portrayal, which I find ultimately off-putting and cheesy. So there was no person with Einstein hair up there. So you know, it was a woman who was playing Einstein and completely cross-casting you know, an Indian fellow who was playing Bohr. So there was no opportunity for an audience to say, mm -hmm, I don't know if that person looks right. That was not part of it. But all the words were taken from the record. And what it did was it allowed an audience to get the ideas, but feel what it was like to discover these ideas, to feel what it was like to be Heisenberg walking in a park in, in Germany in the middle of the night 
muttering to himself, could reality possibly be as absurd as she appears in these quantum mechanical experiments? And feeling like the world was collapsing around him because the solid foundation of classical physics was disappearing. And when an audience can kind of go along for that journey, it does two things. One, it just makes science so much more of a human experience as opposed to just these hard ideas that make your head hurt. But what it also <coughs> does is it gives the audience a sense of relief. Because as they're struggling to understand the ideas, so is Einstein. So is Bohr. So is Heisenberg. And therefore, you feel OK about how difficult it is to grasp what's going on. And that experience, I think, is a strong one. And being part of that has uh, encouraged me and inspired me. So we're doing another one this year on the general theory of relativity. It's the 100th anniversary of general relativity this year. So we're doing another kind of lecture, theatrical. I don't know what the right word is, somewhere in that gray space between the two. So that'll be in May in New York. That will, again, take a similar approach to general relativity. Um, this is kind of, a, I guess, a little bit of a darker side of it, but um, you talked about Heisenberg and him kind of having his world kind of collapse around him. And I was wondering, is there, I guess in the kind of work that you've been doing and kind of like, you know, the near future of physics, is there anything that you um, fear, I guess, about like the consequences of some of the science or just kind of the possible meanings of the universe, or what the universe could have underlying principles in? Well, if you're talking about things like applications of these ideas that would be unpleasant, no, I don't really fear anything like that. In fact, I sort of welcome it because these ideas are so divorced from any application that uh, I don't care what it is. If you can apply it, go forward. Um, but if you're talking more at the level of the kind of reality that these ideas suggest might be out there, is that, is that at all frightening? And um, yeah, you know, if you actually really take these ideas to heart, I think they portray a universe that's quite indifferent to human existence. And that's a hard idea for many people to swallow. But it's almost certainly true. It's almost certainly true that these little creatures walking around on this totally nondescript rocky object that's orbiting this completely ordinary star that's sitting in the suburbs of a completely ordinary galaxy, which is itself one of hundreds of billions of galaxies out there. Are you kidding me? The universe cares about us? That's absurd. And if you take that idea to heart, it is a frightening place we find ourselves in. I mean, we are in this vast universe, and we are all alone. Yeah, there may be other life out there. It doesn't matter. We are alone in the most profound sense. And if you take that in, yeah, is it frightening? It is. On the other hand, if you flip it around, and you say, how amazing is it that these lonely little creatures have been able to figure out so much of the universe? Right? I mean, we've got these theories that allow us to peer back to a fraction of a second after the beginning, allow us to roll the film forward and look eons into the future. We can make predictions about electrons that are accurate to 10 decimal places. That's cause for the most enormous celebration. So kind of both sides of the coin. <coughs> so that's actually 5 o'clock. That's our time. Uh, Good time. <laughs> I think we'd all like to thank Ryan for coming and spending some of his afternoon with us here. So. <laughs> Particularly with the weather that we've put on just for your visit. Thank you. I appreciate um, but uh, I'm looking forward to the talk that's coming up this evening. I hope everyone else is going to be there as well. Um, and just I hope we continue with some of these thoughts and discussions through the rest of uh, this visit. Very good, thank you. Thank good you talk to you.